On this Pentecost Sunday, we are celebrating the Holy Spirit. That's why you hear a lot of these soul on fires and, and other comments that we sing about. For our Lutheran tradition, this is one of the feature Sundays that we lift up the Holy Spirit. From the beginning, the Spirit we know has been a creative force. It was the Spirit that moved and hovered above the dark, still void as God spoke creation into existence. The Spirit came upon certain judges and warriors and prophets in a way that gave them an extraordinary power. For example, Joshua and Gideon and Samson. The Spirit played a prominent role in the long span of Old Testament prophecy. In 2 Samuel, David declared that the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. Likewise, Ezekiel reported that the Spirit entered me when he spoke to me. The Spirit inspires holiness, especially in the Old Testament believers. Um, in Ezekiel 36, 27, Scripture promises that someday God would put his Spirit in his people in a way that would cause them to live according to his ways. And so we encounter the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, but the New Testament as well. In that first chapter of Luke, we are introduced uh, to the Holy Spirit. The angel speaks to Elizabeth, tells her that her son John was going to be great in the sight of the Lord and filled with the Spirit, even within the womb. And then in chapter 3, prior to Jesus' baptism, we get our first connection between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. There were people coming out to be baptized uh, to, to John, and we hear in Luke 3, the crowds asked him, they asked John, what then shall we do? He answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. Whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do so. Soldiers came as well and asked him, And what, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be content with your wages." As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be Christ, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So we have that connection now with Jesus and the Holy Spirit and fire. And so it's no coincidence that the Holy Spirit was now linked to fire. God represented himself and in many ways is manifest in fire throughout the scriptures. He spoke to Moses through a fiery bush in Ezekiel's vision as well. And fire has come numerous times in the judgment of God and a sign of his power. Today, the same, same spirit that ignited the fire of something out of nothing continues to work in us. Today, the same spirit that came down on Jesus in the form of a dove is alive for us. Today, the same Spirit is looking to ignite a flame in the hearts of the people of God. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fall fresh on your people today. Light a fire within us to follow you wherever it may lead us, so that your kingdom will reign over our earthly kingdoms. Enter into us this morning with a freshness that we have not felt before. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Amen. A little warm here in Maryland, a little humid. Uh, in a bit, we're going to have the joy of watching three young men affirm their faith, the faith that their parents had walked them through and shared with them at their baptism. Um, at their baptism, the Holy Spirit was introduced into their lives and is still part of the men that they will grow to be in their faith as they continue their walk with Jesus. And they, like us, will have the opportunity to ask the Holy Spirit to guide them. And as they keep asking, the Holy Spirit will keep responding, as he always has. And it will be amazing. See, there's an awesome image or descri description of the Holy Spirit's presence in 2 Timothy. And last week, it's almost a continuation of last week, when we lifted up the generational motherhood. Uh, we saw mothers that are instrumental in the faith of their children. But Paul goes on after this in 2 Timothy 1, and he starts in verse 6, and he describes the Holy Spirit that is within Timothy through the passing down of his faith. And he writes, Paul writes this, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the Spirit of God gave, gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, 
love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me or of his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel. For by the power of God, he has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. The grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Isn't that an awesome statement of faith? The imagery of flaming into a fire the gift of God, the gift of faith that we are given, and that spirit, that flame that God gave us is not passive. It's powerful. It's loving. And it helps to continue to control our lives to be lived for Jesus. But we hear very clearly, don't be ashamed of the gospel. He's called us. And he saved us to a holy life, not by anything that we've done, but because of his purpose and his grace. It is a gift. I like the way the message version actually puts this gift of faith. It says, in the special gift of ministry you received when I laid hands on you and prayed, keep that ablaze. God doesn't want us to be shy with his gifts, but bold and loving and sensible. But keep that fire ablaze. Keep that faith on fire. Be that soul on fire. Be bold in faith, loving in faith, and sensible in faith. That's that fiery imagery again, right? There's all this talk about the Holy Spirit and the fire within us. But what does it take to ignite that fire within us? Well, I want to go back to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was preaching this baptism of repentance when the people were coming forward. And what we heard was there's a change that happens. To be baptized and to to have that repentance, there's a change that comes with that. And there is a change that comes with following Jesus. There's a fire that comes from following Jesus. A cleansing and a renewing baptism that comes from following Jesus. And it's a consuming fire that wants to see all the world come to him. Church, I ask you, are we living out the same baptism of fire that the Spirit of Jesus calls us to? Are we living into a baptism of repentance? Because it does come with that change in our lives. Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. Whoever has food, do likewise. That was a change in perspective. Collect no more than you are authorized to do so. That is a change of power. Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations. Be content with your wages. That is a change in attitude and self. In other words, it's stop living for yourselves and start living for others. So we need to ask ourselves then, are we sharing with what we have with our neighbors? Are we cheating or are we just getting the edge on people whenever we can? Are we content with having enough? Or do we want more and more and more? I mean, it's very clear there's no doubt we are on fire for the wealth and the power and the prestige and fame and acclamation. And when we seek that fire for ourselves, the fire that purifies and saves gets pushed to the background of our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. So John clearly says, if you want the fire that Jesus can give it, expect it, but it takes some real searching and change about who you are serving. Vance Habner was a 20th century Southern Baptist revivalist. He said, we are not going to move this world by criticism of it nor conformity to it, but by the combustion within, within it of lives ignited by the Spirit of God. So, Who are we serving? What are we on fire for? The early Christians were aflame, and just as moths are attracted to a flame, others will be drawn to us if we burn brightly and intensely for God. But of course, proximity alone is not going to ignite it. We've got to touch them, share that spark with them that will help burst that flame, pass along to them that spark of Jesus Christ. Uh, There's a story out there that that talks about a young man. He became born again. He began to follow Christ. He became a Christian through a one-night community revival. And so he found a church to attend, and he began reading his Bible. And he started with all the Gospels first, but then made his way into Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And so this young man was excited, and he was reading, and he wished to see all those things that were happening in Acts that were manifested. He wanted to see it manifest in him and his church. 
But sadly, he became disillusioned. Every Sunday, he came, he sat, he listened to the liturgy. The sermon was always three points in a prayer. And that neat and tidy service always ended right on time. Well, one day, he asked some of the folks around him. He said, when are you going to do this stuff? (laughs) When are you going to do this stuff? And they, they were like, what stuff? They wanted to know. He said, you know, the stuff. He'd been reading about those conversions and healings and deliverance and other miracles that took place in the early church that were recorded in the books he was reading in Scripture, but he wasn't seeing any signs or wonders. As a matter of fact, he said he didn't see or feel anything. And he was beginning to wonder, is that it? Where's the excitement? Where's the passion? Where's the fire? Where's the zeal? Where's the stuff? See, folks, don't, churches don't move forward because preachers preach good revival sermons. Churches move forward because there's groups of good men and good women in the church who are on fire for Jesus. Who say, we're going to take the next step of faith and obedience and see where God's going to use us. So are we going to be fired up for Jesus? Are we going to live like he lived and do what he did and allow and follow him and serve like he did? That's how churches get lit. And if our church isn't on fire, we have to ask why. Has our fire been somehow muted or extinguished? Are we worried about what someone's going to say about us or or does that quench the Holy Spirit? Are you worried about giving God complete and total control? If so, we've got to find a way to reignite that flame, to pray, to seek out a fresh anointing of that Holy Spirit, to catch our world on fire. Um, have you heard about that word, the word flashpoint? I know it used to be a TV series. I actually enjoyed it. But a flashpoint is when an external source ignites a flame. Right? The conditions are right, um, a match or a spark gets lit, and that flashpoint of a particular element is then ignited. For many Christians, there's a born-again moment or an exciting moment, a time when they're really fired up and they get this ignition moment about them. This is that moment where you hear the words like, I want to follow Jesus, I'm going to commit my life, I want to be saved, or I want to be converted, any of that church terminology we use. That's a flashpoint moment. It's an emotionally charged call, if you will. You see God in a miracle or you experience God on a mountaintop experience. And boom, you're fired up, and God is great, and God is awesome, and that moment's awesome. But it's an event. It's sometimes driven by external circumstances. And don't hear me say that Jesus is not working through all of that, and the Holy Spirit isn't driving us to make those choices that that impact our lives and follow Jesus more clearly. But many times, we have those moments, and we stop. We don't go beyond it. We have a flashpoint moment, and then we're always trying to get back to that same moment because it was so awesome. I had a flashpoint moment in uh, what's called Via de Cristo Weekend. It was in 2004, an amazing, emotional mountaintop weekend where I came out of there and, the, and, and really was on a spiritual high, and I wanted to follow Jesus, and I went into seminary. <laughs> so, whew, right? It pushed me. It was great. But believe it or not, that moment didn't sustain my faith. But I was on fire for Jesus, for sure. I wanted to find that more permanent fire. So I dedicated my life now to that fire. And so our, our faith needs more than a flashpoint moment. We need what's called an auto-ignition temperature rather than a flashpoint. See, we all tend to experience a flashpoint at some point in our lives. And praise God, those moments are amazing. A flashpoint is when an external source ignites that flame in you, right? It's absolutely awesome. We need those moments. They're renewing, they're revitalizing. Those are times when we simply just want to lift up, give thanks for the Spirit moving in our lives. But it's what we do after that when the fire either goes out or it gets hot. So flashpoints are great, but we want that auto-ignition temperature. It's the temperature that it takes for material to combust without a flashpoint. Here's what I mean. Imagine your life is fired up for Jesus so much that you don't need those moments anymore, those flashpoint times. It just runs inside of you. You're constantly on fire. Your auto-ignition temperature is just there all the time. Can you see that? 
Can you imagine being that on fire for Jesus? What would it look like? What would it feel like? So if we're praying for anything, that's what we can pray for. A fire so deep, it doesn't go out. Not not swayed by sports or work or family or any of these other convenient worldly endeavors. Not that they're bad. Those are great. But is our fire for Jesus or our temperature for Jesus hotter than anything else in our life? What's your auto-ignition temperature? What fires you up for Jesus? What would take that spark and catch it into a flame? Because that temperature is the passion that builds inside of you as you grow deeper in your faith and your relationship. And you're fired up for Jesus every moment. Can't wait to see what he's going to do. And it happens regardless of a flashpoint. Because it's a faith that burns as a passion to follow Christ, to serve Christ, to worship Christ. So intense that it burns hotter than anything else in your life. I want to be a part of a church that is on fire for Jesus, don't you? To go out and ignite a community to be on fire for Jesus as well? See, there's an energy and a spirit and a flame that comes from God. But we really have to look at ourselves and say, what do we do with it? Most of us keep it tucked away. Why? We sang that song, Freedom. It's based on Galatians 5, a lot of it. 5.13 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. What Ezekiel prophesied about the Spirit, when he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you, that is happening today, through Jesus. There's a change that happens when you have that Holy Spirit in in your life, and it's on fire. There's a change that happens when you let Jesus in and take control. Because living by the Spirit and with the Spirit means there is a fire within you to change from the old and to put on the new. But most of us can't get past the flashpoint. But what Jesus wants for us through the Holy Spirit is a full transformation. But we are too content with preservation. Rather than move forward in the Spirit, we'd rather stay where we're at, comfortable. So all we get are these flashpoint, flashbang kind of moments, sparks that will impact us for a time, but then they die out. A transformation of the Spirit gives you and I a passion that does not end. That's what the first century disciples had, that God promised them through the Spirit, And this isn't just a fire of Pentecost speaking today, right? But folks, if we're going to live by the Spirit, we've got to walk with the Spirit. We've got to get past the flashpoint. God sent us the Holy Spirit to push us and remind us and challenge us. But more than that, more than anything, to ignite us. God has given us the challenge and the call to make a spiritual impact in the world. And he gives us his power, his Holy Spirit to do it. But if God can't even make a spiritual impact in the aisles of our church, why do we think he's going to make a spiritual impact in the aisles and the streets of the city? Amen? How is God going to raise up a community when there's a graveyard in the sanctuary? I grew up Lutheran. I can speak to it. And we're proud of our graveyard. We celebrate the Spirit once, maybe twice a year, and we're okay with that. Friends, there's so much more in us. Are we settling for a spirit of complacency and mediocrity where all I do is show up when when I feel like it's convenient for me and I give whenever I can, but God wants so much more. He wants so much more. He wants all of it. He wants us to have an all-consuming fire within us. 
He wants a transformation of our minds where the fire of Jesus is shaping and molding everything we do. If someone came to our church today, would they even know the Holy Spirit is here? Today they might, (laughs) once a year. Or would they ask, like that young man did, when's the stuff going to happen? Right? When are you going to do the God stuff? See, it's very easy to determine if something's a flame or if it's on fire. It ignites things around it. But a fire that does not spread will eventually go out. A church without evangelism is a contradiction in terms, just as a fire that does not burn is a contradiction. Church, we need to be spirit-filled, to be expecting change in our lives, to be expecting and seeing a change in the life of our church. If we would open ourselves up to the Holy Spirit, let it fill us, and begin to operate under that power, we would see a change. We would see people drawn to repentance. We'd see people being healed both spiritually, physically, emotionally. We would see lives change and love abound. We would see a revival like we've never seen before. And so we need to experience the unity that a Holy Spirit fire can provide us. That's what the early church had. To live in genuine love with each other. To have that fire fall fresh on us and the people of God to rise up. It's not just us. It seems that all over the world, we fail to reach our ignition points, and the flame doesn't ignite, and we continue to try to do things under our own way, under our own power, because that's the way we've always done it. Folks, we need a change in our mindset, a full transformation to get out of that rut. And the only way to do that is to let the Holy Spirit take control. The same Holy Spirit that is poured out on the day of Pentecost is poured out for us today. So we're going to pray, all of us, together in one voice as a church. We're going to pray. Come, Holy Spirit. And you can pause. Renew us, lead us, challenge us, move us. Gracious God, send us your spirit more and more each day. Help us to learn to trust in you, to hear your voice through the work and the advocate and the helper that you sent us. We're going to continue to worship you today. As we continue to worship, change us. Break our hearts for what breaks yours. Move us to seek out those who need the peace that passes all of our understanding. To keep our hearts and our minds solely on your son, Jesus Christ. It's a power we desperately need. It's a spirit of fire that we have to have. We give thanks for that gift of faith that you have given to us. Help us ignite it into a flame for you. Help us to get fired up for Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen.